Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for um, joining us, us on this wonderful, beautiful fall afternoon. Um, we could not have asked for more gorgeous weather, so it's very kind of you to give up this lovely autumn day to be here with us. And I, I will tell you, it is absolutely worth it because it is really a true delight to be able to honor our wonderful Rosa DeLauro. So um, I welcome you here to the Yale Law School Auditorium and our Fall Chubb Fellowship Lecture with our distinguished guest, the Honorable Rosa DeLauro, our representative in Congress for Connecticut's third congressional district. But before we begin today's program, I ask that you all turn off your cell phones and refrain from taking any photographs while um, Congresswoman DeLauro is uh, speaking today. My name is Mary Liu. I'm a professor in the Department of History and the Programs of American Studies and Ethnicity, Race, and Migration. I'm also the head of college for Timothy Dwight College. And as the head of Timothy Dwight College, I have the honor of serving as the custodian of the illustrious Chubb Fellowship, established in 1941 out of a prior large donation for education purposes made in 1936 by Hendon Chubb, a graduate of the Yale class of 1895. Since its establishment, the Chubb Fund has adhered to the goals of providing encouragement and aid to students interested in government and American public affairs. The fellowship initially aimed to foster among Yale undergraduates an interest in public service and local and state affairs. And this fellowship has grown over the years to include numerous distinguished visitors in national and international affairs, as well as leaders in the world of the arts and the humanities. Since the 1940s, the Chubb Fellowship Lecture Series has inspired generations of Yale students to undertake public service and pursue leadership roles in the hopes of creating a better world today and for posterity. The fellowship has hosted four US presidents, George H.W. Bush, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and Harry Truman. In recent years, we've welcomed a wide range of national and international leaders, including highly decorated Olympic skater Michelle Kwan, visual artist Faith Ringgold, environmental activist Bill McKibben, physician and humanitarian Dr. Hawa Abdi, former Secretary of Transportation and Commerce, as well as Congressman Norman Mineta, songwriter and musician Paul Simon, and many others. So with this very quick description of the history and aims of the Chubb Fellowship, I am delighted that we are honoring today Representative Rosa DeLauro. With her 28 years of distinguished service, she's currently the fourth longest serving Congresswoman in the House of Representatives. Rosa DeLara was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and began her illustrious career in public office soon after completing her degrees from Marymount College and Columbia University. She followed her parents, Theodore and Louisa DeLauro, into public service. Both of her parents were beloved leaders in Worcester Square and served on the Board of Aldermen for the city of New Haven. Her mother, Louisa DeLauro, was the longest serving alder in the history of New Haven. Representative DeLauro has served as the first executive director of EMILY's List, a national organization dedicated to increasing the number of women in elected office. And I think we've seen some of the most wonderful gains in recent years of women in office. And I think it's really to her credit that that has happened. In 1990, Representative DeLauro was elected to the House of Representatives from Connecticut's third congressional district and has served as the Congresswoman for our district ever since. In her 28 years in office, she has fought for the nation's working families by supporting raising the minimum wage, giving employees access to paid sick days, and taking family and medical leave, and helping women to achieve equal pay for equal work. Representative DeLauro serves as the Democratic leadership, as co-chair of the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee, as the chair of the Labor, Health, Human Services, and Education Appropriations Subcommittee, she is working to increase support for education and resources to make college affordable for all. She has fought to protect the Affordable Care Act to keep health care accessible and work to increase funding for biomedical research. In 2017, she published The Least Among Us, waging the battle for the vulnerable with the new press that eloquently defends the importance of maintaining and improving the social safety net for all. So we're deeply honored to have such a distinguished guest join the ranks of the Chubb Fellowship. 
This year, as Yale celebrates the 50th anniversary of co-education in Yale College and the 150th anniversary of women students at the university, I'm especially delighted that we're honoring Representative DeLauro as our Fall Chubb Fellow. Please join me in welcoming Representative DeLauro to the stage. My word, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mary, for such a very warm introduction. And uh, you mentioned my parents. Uh, I will mention them as well. Um, I, I think they're looking down and saying, my God, she is speaking at the Yale Law School. And isn't that uh, a, a quite extraordinary? Uh, but I want to just first say to you, Mary, that uh, how honored I am to have been selected uh, to be the fall a 2019 Chubb Fellow. Uh, I take the honor, I want you to know this, I, I take this honor not as a recognition of past deeds, but as a call, if you will, to push harder to help to make a difference in people's lives. Let me recognize a few people if I can. And to you, Mary, starting the fifth year, I guess, you, you know, and, and heading up Timothy Dwight, I said to Mary, and, walking in uh, many years ago, was asked to be an associate fellow at Timothy Dwight, but the meetings were always like on a Tuesday night and I could never get there. And I just assumed they would turn me out, you know, and say, you don't show up for the meetings, so, you know, you're no longer. But they've, they've hung in with me over the years, so. But you have brought to bear your experience as a historian, and you are helping to promote an atmosphere that fosters conversation, sparks awareness in our students today. You help them to see how their world is shaped, how it shapes them, and how they can shape it. TD is a residential college steeped in history, named for two former Yale presidents and a father and son. Timothy Dwight the fourth and the fifth were among Yale's most influential presidents. The son, oversaw the transition of Yale from a regional clergy college to a university that would become a leader in global education. Let me also say a thank you. Where's Mary Kay Kaminsky? Thank you for helping to organize this effort and for working so close with our office. I would also like to recognize your president, a dear friend, Peter Salovey. He has been integral in my view, in turning this university's attention to elevating justice and opportunity. Two weeks ago, he and Yale helped to host a conference which was honoring the 100th anniversary of the founding of the UN's International Labor Organization, the ILO. It was called and entitled Valuing Women's Work and Building Women's Economic Empowerment. It was rich in content and in participation, and the quality was outstanding. So we say thank you to you, President Salovey, for all that you do to keep Yale and New Haven at the intersection of international history and global change. And finally, to the students, the faculty, the community members, thank you for being here and welcoming me so warmly. To be selected as a Chubb Fellow is a great honor. Created, as Mary pointed out, in 1949, the Chubb Fellowship is to foster an interest in public service among Yale undergraduates. It was started with support from Hendon Chubb, an 1895 graduate of Yale's Sheffield Scientific School. He was a leader in the insurance industry for half century. Called by Insurance Network in 1945 as, and I quote, the leading authority on marine underwriting in America. He helped grow the insurance company that his father 
and his elder brother Percy founded in 1882 to become one of the largest of its kind in the world. He used that success to support philanthropy, including by helping to create the Victoria Foundation, one of the oldest private foundations in the United States. He was not far uh, from government service. He served as director of war insurance, uh, the war risk insurance, and as insurance advisor to the United States Shipping Board. There, he helped to financially protect the men, the ships, and the cargo that was crucial to the U.S.'s victory in World War I. And during the war, he served as an insurance advisor to the American Red Cross. He then helped bring that commitment to leadership and government to Yale with the Chubb Fellowship. And over the years, his fellowship at Yale has grown to include numerous distinguished visitors in national and international affairs. Past recipients include US presidents on both sides of the aisle, as you heard. Newscasters like Walter Cronkite, artists like Maya Angelou, foreign dignitaries, US Supreme Court justices, US cabinet secretaries, ambassadors, senators, members of Congress, and mayors. So for me to be recognized with individuals of such status and import leaves me truly humbled. I am the daughter of a hard-working Italian immigrant family who could only dare to dream that their daughter one day would serve in the United States House of Representatives. My father came in 1913. Actually, in 1913, when he came, he had been in high school and growing up in Italy. But they put him in the seventh grade when he came here. And he left in the seventh grade because his teachers and classmates laughed at him because he could not speak the English language or write the English language. They asked him to define the word janitor. And he didn't know what it meant. But he drew on his Italian language, and he looked, thought about the term genitori, and that means parents and family. And that's the way he described the word janitor. Well, they laughed at him. He walked away from school, but went on to serve his community and to serve his country with distinction. He fought for immigrants who came to New Haven. He fought for their rights. He fought for getting the Italian language taught in the New Haven public schools. My mother worked in the old sweatshops on State Street here in New Haven, which is not very far from here. They were both elected officials in city government. My mom, Louisa, went on to become the New Haven's longest serving alder, which is our city council, and not just the longest serving woman. Their brand of politics was about using government to help people and to be able to create opportunity for people. They didn't develop policy. They didn't write omnibus legislation. But what they did was they made government work for people who were struggling. They worked tirelessly to help people in need. Our kitchen table was their office. They would do everything humanly possible to help someone's kid get his or her first job and to defend the neighborhood. They fought with their parish priest to care more about the poor than about the church's collection basket. They taught me that government can expand opportunity, move us to greater equality. It can help ensure the life, health, and the dignity of families, that we can build social insurance against misfortune. And they taught me that we have intergenerational responsibilities to each other. We have a moral obligation to help the most vulnerable, and that we are not every man or woman for himself or herself. That has been my mission throughout my career, and in particular, 
throughout my tenure in the Congress. To serve in government as they did, I understand the power that government has to impact people's lives. Now, Frances Perkins once described her mission serving under President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. She was the Secretary of the Department of Labor and a primary author of the New Deal programs, including Social Security. She said, and I quote, I came to Washington to work for God, FDR, and the millions of forgotten, plain, common, working men. I would add women today, but I too went to Washington to work on behalf of the working people of this country. Late in 2008, I flew to Chicago to meet the then president-elect Barack Obama to interview for the cabinet position of Secretary of Labor. I told the president-elect that my role model was Frances Perkins. So I said the first female Secretary of Labor. And when she was interviewed by FDR, she presented to him what she wanted to accomplish. Minimum wage protection, work hours legislation, workmen's compensation, workplace safety regulations, federal aid for unemployment, a national pension system, as well as a system for health insurance. I told President-elect Obama I wanted to be a labor secretary like Frances Perkins. I also told him that whether or not I got the job, I would continue to advocate for what I believed in from wherever forum that I found myself. And now I serve as the chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee which funds the Department of Labor, as well as the Departments of Health and Human Services and Education. It is one third of this country's non-defense discretionary spending. After the Department of Defense, Labor HHS has the largest command and portfolio of programs that affect people's daily lives and resources. It's approximately $200 billion a year. From that vantage point, I have the opportunity to put into action the values on which I have centered my career. Government has the capacity to help people, to advance the common good. And even more, as I said a moment ago, I believe government has the moral obligation to do so for the sake of working people and for the vulnerable. Growing up in New Haven, I saw ample evidence all around me of just how vulnerable hardworking people are in the face of corporate indifference. In 1957, when I was barely a teenager, the Franklin Street Fire claimed the life of my friend's mother. Fifteen people died in that disastrous fire because they could not escape the smoke and the flames. A fire escape was locked. The ladder would not extend to the ground. There had, had not been any fire drills. The doors opened the wrong way, blocking exits. It was a disaster, and it happened down the street from my house. It was impossible to be an eyewitness to an event like that and not be touched by the gravity of our responsibility to one another. It bears repeating, and I wrote a book, and Mary mentioned that. I wrote a book about my legislative fights in the Congress to empower the vulnerable. And I opened with this. It bears repeating that corporations do not feel free to poison us, sell us spoiled meat, lock our daughters up in ninth floor sweatshops with no fire escapes, 
employ our underage sons in coal mines, force us to work 13-hour shifts without overtime or a break, or call in private armies to fire rifles at those of us who dare strike for higher wages. It's not because corporation experienced a moment of zen and decided to evolve. No, they were forced into greater accountability and social concern by the legitimate actions of a democratic small d government. In other words, if we depend on goodwill, we are all screwed. <laughs> that is my inspiration. That is what motivates me. And it is a value reflected in this nation's social safety net. What is the social safety net? It is making sure that people get a break, particularly in difficult times. Technically, the social safety net is an array of government programs that ensure that no American will fall so far down the socioeconomic ladder that getting back up on their feet becomes impossible. It is making sure that kids do not get punished for their parents' poverty. The programs include Medicare, Medicaid, Affordable Care Act to help the sick, Social Security to help our seniors, food stamps to help the hungry, minimum wage, and broad-based income supports like unemployment insurance and the child tax credits. They are more than just programs. It is about being accountable to one another. Our safety net is one of the country's greatest legacies. And it set the stage for a century of unparalleled prosperity that made the United States a beacon for the world. It was not something dreamed up by ideologues with an agenda to weaken the average American's moral fiber. The safety net's growth was incremental. It was in a genuine response to systemic crises. For 40 years, these efforts were supported by Republicans and Democrats alike. I did the research. It's all there. That when we faced challenges in this nation, despite our differences, our philosophies, we said we must act, and we did. These laws were not written by naive people. These Democrats and Republicans understood why they came to the Congress. And the social safety net acknowledges that progress on the whole makes us richer, more powerful, but that it also leads to incredible uncertainty and volatility. They realized that safeguards against familial financial calamity benefited both the unfortunate and those in better circumstances by preserving broad-based stability and confidence in the future. Columbia University School of Social Work, their Center on Poverty and Social Policy, recently estimated the report that poverty has fallen nearly 40 percent since the 1960s. And much of that reduction is due to our social safety net programs. Each year, each year, Social Security lifts 26.5 million people out of poverty. The earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, lifts 9.1 people out of poverty. The food stamp program, four and a half million people. SSI, 3.3 million. Housing assistance, two and a half million. And yet, some have become so determined to destroy the safety, that safety net, and make government illegitimate. We have seen it over and over again. With Newt Gingrich, with Paul Ryan, and now with President Trump. 
I was elected to the Congress in 1990 and served two terms in the majority. It's good to be in the majority, I might add. I was determined to be a legislator, but the Gingrich Revolution changed that trajectory. My book shows that I had to combine my political and organizing skills with a determination to legislate change. Newt Gingrich's contract with America include many elements intended to curtail the role of government. That includes closing the Department of Education, eliminating the National Endowment for the Arts, and ending the school lunch program. It was the kind of madness that enabled us to mobilize around the country and circle the U.S. Capitol with protesting kids, induced with ice cream, I might add, contributed by Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> but they sent 20,000 paper plates to members of Congress saying, don't end my school lunch. That time, Republicans were determined to cut $270 billion for Medicare, turn it into a system of underfunded health clinics that would, quote, wither on the vine. To achieve that, they led the first ever shutdown of the federal government and lost. But they have not failed entirely. For the last two or three decades, these efforts have been successful in undermining the collective strength of working people by starving funding at the federal level and by anti-union laws in the states. Now union membership is half what it was in the 1980s. And the erosion of unions, of worker protections, of stagnant wages has coincided with a dramatic rise in inequality. We saw tax giveaways for the richest Americans in 2001, 2003, 2017. The consequences spiked inequality, reduces our capacity to invest in infrastructure and in, in, in education, just to name a few. The attacks did not end there. Paul Ryan was empowered with the Tea Party's rise in 2010. And he used the moment to try to end Medicare and Medicaid, as we know them. Again, to leave Social Security, to privatize it, to let it wither on the vine. In fact, in his first major policy speech as Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan said that 45 million Americans living in poverty were, quote, stuck in neutral. He said that we needed to get them, quote, off the sidelines. And he famously called the social safety net, and I quote, a hammock that lulls able-bodied people to lives of dependency and complacency. He lived up to his words. When he was chairman of the House Budget Committee, he achieved two-thirds of his budget savings by cutting from programs designed to help working families and the poor. Paul Ryan's ideas expose the reason behind his thinking on poverty. If you can only make receiving government aid onerous enough and humiliating enough, then people will opt out voluntarily, redouble their efforts to avoid hunger, illness, or being laid off. That idea is a slap in the face to the millions who do everything right and still cannot get by. It is a betrayal of a legacy of good government in the United States. And now the current administration has nationalized the battle against government. We are witnessing the most massive assault on the social safety net in recent history. Everything is at risk, and we are watching an historic pushback by the American people. And I might add, starting with the Women's March and ending with last year's blue wave. Women voters in particular 
have led the pushback. Unmarried women, that's women who are widowed, single, divorced, or separated. White working class women, college educated, and suburban women have led the way and are leading the way. Women candidates were victorious in the Democratic primaries and the election. And in 2018, we produced the most diverse U.S. House of Representatives in our nation's history. 100 women, the most women ever. And now women chair six full committees and 39 subcommittees in the House. When more women are at the table, it's not a question of numbers, it's about the agenda changing and what are the issues that we take up. The agenda is transformed, and the agenda has been transformed for the people. They were reacting to a government that was disproportionately hurting women. Let me just give you some examples. In the departments that I oversee, the Department of Health and Human Services decreased nursing home protections for seniors, 70% of whom are women. It attacked contraceptive care, costing women $1.4 billion more per year in co-payments. It went after Planned Parenthood, Title X, and comprehensive sex education. Department of Education rolled back protections for sexual assault survivors, allowed predatory for-profit colleges to get away with financially exploiting women seeking a college education. Women comprise 65% of all students at for-profit colleges, and they hold two-thirds of outstanding student debt, roughly about $800 billion. The Department of Agriculture limited millions of women's access to anti-hunger programs, including food stamps. Women are twice as likely as men to have received food stamps, which has kept approximately 42.2 million people all over the country from growing, from going hungry. Just a moment on hunger. People presume that that's somewhere else. I will just tell you that in this third congressional district that I represent, it's 25 towns, one out of seven people every night goes to bed not knowing where their next meal is coming from. We have a hunger issue, not only in this state, but all over the country. We mentioned the Department of Labor. It unraveled the overtime rule, which ha would have provided overtime pay protections to 3.2 million women. The Office of Management and Budget also effectively received reverse steps by the Obama administration to fix the gender pay gap. Made it more difficult, the Department of Labor has made it more difficult to organize and to engage in collective bargaining. These actions were a systematic attack on women, rightly called out as a war on women, and now the U.S. House of Representatives is moving the country in a different direction. Who is at the table matters. We are using our platform as the majority in the House to rewrite the rules, to restore the balance between corporations and labor, and to restore America's promise to help working people. The U.S. House passed, I'll say my, I don't mean to be self-serving, but it is my equal pay bill which I introduced in 1997. The Paycheck Fairness Act passed with a large bipartisan majority, 242 to 187, with seven Republicans in favor. It's a very simple premise. Men and women in the same job deserve the same pay. No more than that. It's true in the United States Congress. We come from all over the country, different skill sets, different educational backgrounds. We all get paid the same. It's not true in the rest of the country for others. There are more women than ever are working in the American economy. However, women still make just 82 cents on average to the man's dollar across every profession, a gap that increases even more when you look at the wages of Latina and black women. 
The Paycheck Fairness Act will mean is essential progress in the fight to eliminate the gender wage gap and to help families. And it's my fervent hope that it will be the first bill signed by a new Democratic president. The U.S. House of Representatives has also passed Raise the Wage Act to raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2025. It's been 10 years since the last increase, the longest period between increases in the history of the federal minimum wage. It is clearly time, and it will raise wages for 34 million Americans. You know, the single biggest economic challenge we have today is that people are in jobs that don't pay them enough to deal with the rising costs of health care, child care, education. Just they live from paycheck to paycheck. I work with many of my allies in moving what I have called and coined a working families agenda, the Healthy Families Act for paid sick days in the Senate. Washington State Senator Patty Murray is the sponsor. The United States is the only developed country that does not guarantee paid sick days. We don't guarantee. And there's no maternity care in the United States. You can hardly believe that. The Family Act for paid leave. I first introduced it with Senator Ted Kennedy in 2004, and now with Senator Kirsten Gillibrand losing weeks worth of wages in order to care for an ill loved one would push many families over the financial edge. But only 14% of private sector workers earn paid family leave through their employers. And fewer than 40% have access to personal medical leave. My mom passed away two years ago. The last six weeks of her life, she spent between Yale New Haven Hospital and hospice. My husband and I were there every single day. No one told me, your job isn't there. No one said, you can't get paid. It should not be only for members of Congress. The country needs to have paid sick days so that they can take care of themselves or their families in a time of crisis. The Schedules at Work Act with Senator Elizabeth Warren. Too few workplaces provide the 21.6 million workers in low-wage service sector jobs with schedules that allow them to succeed. In fact, a survey of the early career employees found that 41% of hourly workers get their schedules only a week or less in advance. And nearly half of these workers have no input into their schedules. The American Family Act to strengthen and expand the child tax credit, introduced in the Senate by Senator Sherrod Brown and Senator Michael Bennett, it would cut poverty in half in a decade. An anomaly in the current law blocks one-third of needy children from the full benefits of the child tax credit. A recent study found that the American Family Act would help over 700,000 children in Connecticut by delinking the child tax credit from income so that families will no longer be ineligible for the full benefit because they earn too little. Many are excluded today because they earn too little. The very people who need to have that kind of financial help. And I am proudly using the gavel of the Labor HHS, that's the Labor, Health, and Education Appropriation Subcommittee. We've been holding hearings to put a spotlight on the alarming and, awful, and often illegal conduct of the administration. We have hosted 16 oversight and budget hearings on e-cigarettes and vaping, on the crisis of unaccompanied minors being separated and detained at the southern border, on predatory for-profit colleges, federal student loan servicing, 
the unaccompanied children program, wage th theft, and the administration's cost-increasing changes to the Affordable Care Act, and gun violence prevention research. As part of that work, we have hosted hearings on, and if I'll take a minute really to talk about the treatment of unaccompanied children at the border and the intentional policy choices by the administration, which have resulted in what I term government-sponsored child abuse and trauma. The reason why I engaged in this effort is because in the subcommittee that I chair is something called the Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR. We are responsible for the unaccompanied children who come across the border. The Department of Homeland Security is an immigration enforcement agency. In essence, what Health and Human Services and ORR is, it, if you will, is a child welfare agency. Department of Homeland Security takes them, holds them for what they're supposed to be for not more than 72 hours, and then shifts them over to the jurisdiction of Health and Human Services. I provided a bipartisan briefing uh, by the Office of the Inspector General of Health and Human Services to let our colleagues know what was going on. No press, no fanfare, just to get a sense of what was happening. Last year, I toured facilities. I was in McAllen, Texas, and in Brownsville to see what was there. It was worse than I had ever imagined. Children were in cages, very high. They're not covered with a top and so forth with this, but these high page-linked fences. It, 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 it was staggering. What was more staggering was, and my colleague Jim Hines, Congressman Hines uh, from Connecticut, we went to visit one of those uh, detention centers where they hold the children for 72 hours. We peered into a room, and it was like mylar. You know, this is very thin mylar silver. It was like covering the floor. And we were talking. Uh, all of a sudden, the mylar started to move. And out from under the mylar were all of these children under that blanket to keep warm. Because I, I'm, I, I don't make this up. Short sleeves, it's a hot climate, but they're taken into very cold rooms, rubbing their arms. I was spoke to mothers. I spoke to daughters people who were held in separate cells. I spoke to more than a dozen mothers who had not seen their children in over a month. They were sobbing. They had no idea where their children were. The administration initiated a zero tolerance policy of separating children at the border. And at the time, the Chief of Staff, General Kelly, was asked if this was a way to deter immigration. He said yes. So it was a conscious policy to deter immigration. And what's the harshest thing that you might be able to do to a family? Ask yourselves. They took your child. You were one place, your child another, and you don't know where they are. They don't know where you are. Again, think about this. You go to a restaurant to eat. You put your coat in the cloakroom. They give you a claim check. You go to the cleaners, you drop your clothes off. They give you a claim check. You put your luggage in storage. They give you a claim check. 
I will tell you there was no claim check for your child. It was only because of the ACLU that we've been able, in many instances, to reunite children with their families. Over 4,000 children separated from their families. If you can imagine the terror, not just for the parents, but of a child who doesn't know where his or her mother or father is, or feeling abandoned, and what damage that is doing and has done to these children. Earlier this year, I visited what they call as an influx facility in Homestead, Florida. I'm frankly I'm hoping to get word within the next little while that we're going to shut down the Homestead facility. On our visit, we confirmed that the federal government is using federal property to skirt federal standards of care, failing to have fully adequate mental health providers, education facilities. I was there. I, I visited. I saw it. They were failing to get children out quickly, as is their responsibility. The mission of, of, of um, Health and Human Services with these children is to put them in a safe, I, I highlight the word safe environment as quickly and as expeditiously as possible. So we were told by some of the children that they had been there for 44 days, 56 days, 60 days, when in fact they do have family members in the United States. So what has been the holdup? I'll just give you this last two facts. Last December, there were 15,000 children in detention in the US, kids who came across the border. Either they were separated from their family and then they became unaccompanied or came unaccompanied. The reason why we're not, they were not moving them out quickly was because of policies. Uh, and an agreement between Health and Human Services and Homeland Security. What, is the, what was the agreement? You come forward as a sponsor for one of these children. We find out that you are undocumented. You then are deported. So the whole network of sponsors dried up. No one coming forward. The other piece was, again, I come forward. I would like to take one of these children. And in fact, and I believe in this, you vet the person, fingerprint, and make sure that this is a safe, a safe environment for this child. They decided then to fing fingerprint every person in the household. It ground the process to a halt. They subsequently changed those under a lot of pressure. Uh, and I would tell you, they told me that shortly after they did this, that they were moved 8,000 children out of the process in record time. So they could have been doing this all along and not putting these kids through all this difficulty. Our worst fears were confirmed by the Office of the Inspector General. Their latest report confirmed that intentional policy choices by the administration created a mental health crisis with children, which the Office of Inspector General said that Health and Human Services and the Office of Refugee uh, Resettlement failed to address. It is a crisis of deliberate, as I said, in my view, government-sanctioned child abuse. But we have worked to put a spotlight on this. We've also brought up members of the President's Cabinet to ensure they're holding up their mission and advancing policies that benefit working families. We held a hearing in March with Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, in those remarks, he emphasized the need for greater oversight around charter schools. I reminded Secretary DeVos that the teachers striking to get fair wages are not hurting our schools and students, as she tried to claim. It is her attempt to gut public education that is hurting our schools and students. The three education budgets from the administration have proposed the largest cuts to education funding since the department was created in 1979. But I will just tell you, and again, this probably sounds self-serving to you, as long as I am chair of this subcommittee, those cuts will not happen. 
We are committed to defending public schools, students, and staff. And this year, we held the first appropriations hearing on gun violence prevention research. In 20 years, we have been precluded from even holding a hearing on research and finding out how we can prevent gun violence. The experts told us that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Institutes of Health can do and must do this research. So we provided in the appropriations bill $50 million. The Department of Labor, its mission is to quote, to foster, promote, and develop the welfare of wage earners, job seekers, and retirees of the United States, improve working conditions, advance opportunities for profitable employment, and assure work-related benefits and rights. Yet, the administration has hollowed out the Department of Labor to take the agency from enforcement to compliance, from weeding out bad actors to offering bad actors technical assistance, from being a tough cop on the beat to being a friend of industry. We pressed, and the, the, the then head of the Department of Labor, Alex Acosta, on why only 43% of the department's senior roles were filled, compared to 80% under previous administrations. The Department of Labor was tied for the worst in the entire federal government. It was not just the staff, but the protections for working people. They allowed franchises, contractors, and subcontractors, staffing agencies, to commit wage theft. They allowed child labor in health professions, putting teenagers at risk of injury. They blocked electronic reporting, preventing the public from knowing detailed workplace injury information. They shortchanged 3 million American workers from getting their overtime. They weakened protections for construction and shipyard workers from beryllium exposure. They allowed contractors who cheat their workers to continue with, quote, business as usual. Their rollbacks to coal dust rules and the like have coincided with a 25-year high of black lung cases in Appalachian coal mining states. Under this administration, the Department of Labor has become a shell of an agency. It is not just the fight over policy that we are facing. Look, you are seeing every day a constitutional crisis. Democracy is at stake. We take democracy for granted in this country. We do. Democracy is fragile. But we have a president who is indifferent to the law, indifferent to right and wrong, and indifferent to the limits imposed by the Constitution. I was very reluctant to call for an impeachment inquiry. Why? Because I feared it would continue to divide the country. I was concerned that we would relitigate the uh, 2016 election. And ultimately, if it went to the United States Senate, I, I thought that regardless of the evidence, that there would not be any conviction. But given the turn of events in the last month, I concur with the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, that we have crossed the Rubicon. Using the power of office to invite a foreign power to interfere in our elections is illegal. Recent revelations unveil a pattern of confirmed abuse of power by the president, withholding foreign aid in exchange for an investigation of a political opponent. But I, as I am watching this, as the chair of Labor HHS, as that subcommittee, and as someone who could chair the full appropriations committee in 2021, I'm aware that it is a different kind of constitutional crisis. They are successfully hollowing out government, eradicating protections for workers and women, taking us back to a time when corporations were unchecked. Stopping President Trump is not enough. 
We need to mobilize. We need to build up to getting back to a time when both parties worked together, where they understood that the social safety net is our shared legacy and how to make it stronger and not how to destroy it. That is why I think of the words of a hero of mine, Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American woman to be elected to the Congress. She once said, and I quote, they asked her, how do you make progress? And she said, you don't make progress by standing on the sidelines, by whimpering and complaining. You make progress by implementing ideas. That is what we must be doing. We should not rely on the goodwill of corporations. We should not abandon government for the common good. We should not believe we can simply stand on the sidelines whimpering or complaining and see change. We must return to a time when both parties agreed to build the social safety net, to make opportunity real for people. We must be mobilizing all of civil society to reclaim our country and our history. We need to demand progress, and we need to demand our country back. Thank you for honoring me as a fall 2019 Chubb Fellow. I take it as a responsibility to move forward. of our um, aides are going to come around with the microphone. We have time for probably two questions. Sorry. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Questions? Question. Not a shy audience. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no. The Merit Systems Protection Board is designed to protect 4 million federal employees, and there are no judges on the appeals panel. It's been that way for almost three years. No case has been heard. Is there anything that can be done sure. to protect my rights? In the short term, I mean, I am political. I, it's who I am. It's what I strive for. It's what I'm looking for is legislation that protects people's rights. Unless we have a change in this Department of Labor and people understand the need for protection, it will not change. It will not. What the most unbelievable thing for me these days is there's so much that is on TV. All important stuff. Please don't misunderstand me. But foundationally of what is being eroded is not coming across to the American people. It just isn't. Quite frankly, it doesn't sell TV ratings or newspapers. It is, and that is what, honestly, and it's not hyperbole, it really is what it keeps me up because you cannot there's so many holes, you, can't, you don't have enough fingers to keep in the dike here so that you can prevent some of these things from happening. We're trying, we're doing our best. And look, if people say we are not passing legislation, I can just tell you there are 375 bills, some of more or less importance, that are at the doorstep of the United States Senate. And Mitch McConnell will not move. He self-describes as the Grim Reaper. I would never describe myself in those terms. I mean, my gosh, you know, but that's where it's going. But you're right. Your rights are being eroded. And we are trying. We need just, we need people who understand, you know, the Department of Labor, the NLRB, what is all at stake here? How do we take back those rights that we fought so hard for over the years? And it frightens me. 
I would, I would lie to you, I, you know, of, you, you know, it's like sand, you know, through your fingers and you, and you can't, you can't get hold of it. So please stand up. We continue to fight. You know, my mom also told me two things, never take no for an answer and never give up. So you just damn the torpedoes full steam ahead, which is what we need to do over the next, was it 13 months? Okay. Mm -hmm. Given the administration is contemptuous of Congress, yeah. isn't it about time that Congress held them in contempt, fine them, maybe even jail them? You can't keep going and allow them to flout the laws. Mm -hmm. I well, hope. You know, again, a number of us came to the issue of an inquiry, an impeachment inquiry. Uh, it was just about a month ago, I think. And I, I was asked the question many times. Uh, uh, but before, about a month ago, mostly people didn't speak to me about that. They talked about their economic insecurity and what we were doing in that regard, prescription drugs and everything else. But now it's just, you, you, you know, it's beyond comprehension. But, you know, I'm standing here at Yale Law School. There are probably a lot of lawyers in this office, in this audience. You know, help us. You know, we're going through a process. A as it is, you saw what happened yesterday or what the news is today that everything that we're doing is in secret. Well, if you'll go back to the uh, impeachment of Bill Clinton, you know that, that there was a, a, a special uh, uh, select uh, committee, and Ken Starr did all of the depositions in private because they don't want witnesses listening to one another. I'm not a lawyer, but that's what happened. We don't have the same kind of a structure. It is the Intelligence Committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Oversight Committee. So these depositions are being held privately. There will be public hearings. But you saw that they stormed the Bastille, you know, uh, I, or, or I'm going to ask them if they're going to do that next, uh, honestly. But, you, you know, where we go if we are listening to classified uh, 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 information. Uh, so it's very difficult to do what you're trying to do with all the legal minds at this university and elsewhere. You help us because we are a nation of laws. We just don't turn it around because we feel like it one day. But how do we turn it around and use the legal profession to get it done? Because I do not want to. I don't want to undercut that portion of our democracy that allows our strength and, and, and committed to the law, committed to a, 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 an independent judiciary, committed to three equal branches of government. Those are bedrock, and we should not fly in the face of that. So I ask your help on that. Who else? After a very divisive 2016 primary campaign, yeah. we failed as a party to come back together to heal and to reunite sufficiently to win that election. What is the role of the Democratic Party, those of you who are the leaders of it, uh, to try to prevent that kind of uh, division uh, that we see all too often right now in, in the debates and, and on the campaign trail? from leading us to defeat again yeah. without well, putting somebody's thumb on the scale and uh, unfairly mm -hmm. uh, tipping, the, tipping the balance in, in the election. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just uh, for a moment just uh, re reflect on, on 2016, okay? And I'll be absolutely upfront. I was a very strong supporter of, of, of uh, uh, um, Hillary Clinton. Yeah. There were a lot of things that were... Um, difficult about the campaign. Uh, however, and I would not have a problem having a direct conversation with Hillary Clinton about this. Uh, I believe the campaign was mishandled. 
when, and I say the, for, for Democrats, which is even true today about where we would need to go. I, I think the, there wasn't a realization by Democrats that they needed to connect again, reconnect with working Americans. There was no debate, no discussion about an economic vision for people who were in deep trouble. It was, we're going to continue to create the job. You go to the middle of the country. You know, you went out to dinner with people on Saturday night. Yeah, I did. But you say, how can those people be so stupid? They're not stupid. Their lives were falling apart. And they still are. They lost a job. Couldn't get another one. Couldn't pay for education for their kids. Couldn't pay for health care. Watch their families disintegrate. Deal with opioid addiction because that was a way to try to assuage what was going on. There was no recognition of the depth of that economic struggle in 2016. And when you don't go to Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, you have missed the boat. So it wasn't a question of being not united in 2016. There were a lot of issues. Let's fast forward to where we are today. And you know, surprisingly, I, 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 I hope you believe me, but you know, I listened, and look, I'm of the view, I haven't made, you know, a, an endorsement yet. I am listening to people, but if you listen to the folks who are up on the, on the stage, the themes are, are the same. Look, I, I just pull one out of a hat. Healthcare, okay? Wherever you are on the spectrum of healthcare, do you understand that all of the Democrats are talking about universal health care? We did not have, we haven't had that debate. We couldn't have it several years ago. You may want to get it there one way or the other. Medicare for all, I have Medicare for America, you have public option. But my God, and they sh this should not be adversarial. This is about having the fulsome, the robust debate about how this country gets to universal health care. And they're there. They're having that. They're having that debate. But the strain that goes through as well is look at their focus on what's going on in middle class America, uh, the working poor. The, uh, they're all talking about that, about jobs, about how people get back on their feet about the rigged system that provides the tax cuts to the richest one-tenth of one percent in the country and leaves everyone else out. Honestly, look, yeah, do I want them sniping at one another? No, I don't. I don't think that that's helpful. But in terms of the content and the, poli and the policy direction, there's little difference. And there isn't a division. Please do not let the press or others talk about a division in the Democratic Party. There is more unity, and I could talk for the House, okay? I won't speak to the Senate, okay? Which I, also, I call the dark side. <laughs> I call it the dark side. And, but in the House, people have different views, different, difference of opinion, but we are united. We understand. There was a division over whether or not to move to an impeachment inquiry. I think there may be two or four Democrats who have not signed on to that effort. And that has mostly to do with what their districts look like. You know, some got elected by the skin of their teeth in some very, very red places. We are not divided. We also understand that you can carry on investigations, which is the point I was making, and you can legislate. And we are legislating. We're going to move to prescription drugs. We've done background checks. As I said, we did paycheck fairness. We did the Equality Act, which we couldn't get done for 15 years. So we have to keep from cannibalizing one another in this upcoming election. 
we have to reconnect with people in this country who thought that Democrats don't care about what my life is about or what's happening to my family. I think we can get there. I think we can get there. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. So what's going on with you? I'm good. I've been actually thinking. But we'll say, what? Hey, you. And you. You all right? I'm good. I'm good. You've got the boy here. Have a great time, Mr. Jackson. Okay, fine. We can wait. Yeah. May I? Yes. <laughs> we'll be free. I'm coming. All right.